Did you know that the first space station ever deployed was a Soviet invention from the 1960s? It was a disaster. The first and only crew to ever visit the Salyut 1 would never live to tell the tale, but that was only the beginning of the long and prolific Soviet obsession with the space station. Salyut was launched to orbit April 19, 1971, an impressive piece of hardware for its time at 16 meters in length, 4 meters in diameter, 19 metric tons in weight, and 90 cubic meters of internal volume. Even by modern standards, that's pretty big. It's almost double the size of Europe's Columbus Laboratory on the ISS. This was made possible by the Soviet Proton rocket. Like all good Soviet space engineering, Proton began its life as a weapon of mass destruction, a gigantic intercontinental ballistic missile with the ability to send a 100 megaton warhead as far as 13,000 kilometers around the world. Moscow could have nuked Hawaii with this thing and still had fuel left over. Now, we don't talk about the first space station very often because there is a deeply tragic story attached to it. You see, the crew of Soyuz 11 spent 23 days on board Salyut 1. It was the longest time any person had lived in outer space. The crew carried out a series of experiments in astrophysics, biology, Earth observations, and technology, and served as test subjects to study the effects of long-term weightlessness on the human body. The crew of Salyut 1 would do live broadcasts every night on Russian television, demonstrating experiments and teaching the public about their life in space. So the three men quickly became national heroes. Now, it wasn't exactly an easy stay on the space station. There were problems with electrical fires, the crew reported arriving to a smoky environment on board, we know there was at least one fire that broke out during their stay, and reportedly even caused the crew to leave the station early. Unfortunately, there was a small but catastrophic failure that occurred on the re-entry of their spacecraft. A seal in the ventilation system came loose and opened up as the return capsule was separating from the main vehicle. The result was a full depressurization in the vacuum of space, which ultimately resulted in the suffocation and death of all three cosmonauts, making them the first and only humans to have died in space. The operation of Salyut 1 was terminated shortly after. The station was deorbited and burnt up in the atmosphere on October 11th, 1971. However, this was not the end. It was, in fact, only the beginning. Salyut wasn't actually the beginning of the space station, though. The true origins date back to the early 1960s and the Soviet Almaz program, which means diamond in Russian. This highly secretive military project was just one of many Soviet efforts to keep pace with and surpass the Americans in the early space race. There had been rumors that the US Air Force had been working on something called the Manned Orbiting Laboratory, so naturally, the USSR would need their own equivalent. The Almaz space station program involved three major hardware components. The orbital piloted station, a dedicated cargo resupply craft, and a crew capsule known as the VA spacecraft. Unlike the American single-use laboratory, the Soviets designed Almaz to be a long-term orbital platform that would be recrewed and resupplied multiple times, just like what we know today. The US space station never went anywhere and was cancelled in 1969, but the Almaz was simply rebranded into the Salyut program, which means salute in Russian but also refers to fireworks as well. The idea here was to create some perceived separation from the military Almaz station, and introduce Salyut as a civilian science endeavor, which was kind of true, but it also didn't stop the Russians from strapping giant guns to their future space station either. Despite the tragic outcome of their first attempt, the Soviets would not be discouraged from pressing on with the space station initiative. And just one short year later, they tried again with the space station module called DOS-2. But this one was lost due to an engine failure on the Proton rocket, and it never reached orbital velocity. The whole thing just fell into the ocean. One year after that, the Soviets made their third attempt with Salyut 2. This one did reach orbit, but quickly lost control and depressurized, leaving it to tumble helplessly through space until its orbit decayed and the station burnt up in the atmosphere. This station was secretly known in the USSR as Almaz, 
signaling its intent to be used as a military outpost had it been successful. Undeterred, the Soviet Union launched yet another space station module in 1973. This was originally intended to be Salyut the Third, but a flight control error prevented the station from reaching the correct orbital height. The Soviets quickly renamed the mission to Cosmos 557 and pretended like it was a regular satellite launch and not a failed space station deployment. A week later, the remains fell from space and burned up in the atmosphere. The real Salyut 3 achieved orbit in July 1974 and was successfully visited by the crew of Soyuz 14. The station was also secretly known as Almaz 2, designating it as a military space station, the first successful military base in Earth orbit, also the first spacecraft to include a gun. The crew of Salyut 3 were armed and they were not afraid to use it. Unofficial reports claim that the station was equipped with a 23mm aircraft cannon that had been borrowed from a Soviet MiG fighter jet, which became the first conventional weapon ever test-fired in space. To operate the cannon, the crew had to maneuver the entire space station in the direction of the target. Sources claim that the station conducted three tests of the gun through the whole mission span of Salyut 3. Anyway, from there, the Soviets had a pretty successful run with these single-module space stations, from Salyut 3 all the way up to Salyut 7, but this was only a warm-up act. In 1986, the world saw the beginning of the first ever long-duration modular space outpost, which the Soviets named Mir. Like many Russian words, Mir can mean a few things. Peace, world, or community. Either way, it was a very positive title for a very ambitious construction project in low Earth orbit. The station began with a core module known as DOS-7. It was pretty similar in design to the Salyut stations that had preceded it with an interior that was built to be more comfortable with living accommodations for a crew of three, plus the addition of two extra docking ports that would connect future expansion modules. Remember back when we said that the Almaz space station program included a dedicated cargo resupply craft? Well, that was never actually built, but the design was recycled and used to create the additional modules that would grow Mir to its fully operational size. The second module arrived in 1987, Cavant 1. This brought science capabilities to Mir, featuring both pressurized and unpressurized experiment compartments. It also carried additional life support systems, including an electron oxygen generator and equipment for removing carbon dioxide from the air. Cavan 2 arrived in 1989 and brought with it a dedicated airlock for extravehicular activities. It was also equipped with a high-resolution camera and a wide range of spectrometers and detectors for advanced scientific observation of the outer space environment. Crystal was the next major addition in 1990. This also means crystal, just like in English. This introduced even more science capabilities to Mir. It had a dedicated astrophysics lab, X-ray telescope, ultraviolet telescope, and biotechnology experiment lab, and had become a pretty close match for what the Americans were doing with their space shuttle operations. Now, something interesting happened during the time period that Mir was being constructed. The Soviet Union collapsed. The fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 marked the beginning of the end for the Cold War, and as we enter the year 1992, the period of the Russian space program begins. This era would bring a newfound cooperation between Western and Eastern superpowers. Now, instead of being engaged in a space race, the Russians and Americans were working together for the betterment of human space exploration. Very positive Star Trek vibes were starting to come out. And in 1993, NASA's space shuttle fleet began regular missions to the Mir station. Not that the Russians really had much of a choice at the time, they desperately needed the Americans' help to keep Mir in operation, and America wasn't about to let the former Soviet space program fall into the wrong hands either. So we as Western people tend to celebrate the fall of the Soviet Union as a good thing, but for the people who were living through it at the time, things were not so good. According to the official Russian economic statistics, the nation's GDP fell by roughly 50% from the year 1990 to 1995. This is a far greater decline than what the US experienced during the Great Depression. That was only 30% between 1929 and 1933, so the Russian economy 
was trashed. And one of the biggest victims of that decline was the space program. You see, space exploration was kind of looked at like a symbol of the old Soviet empire, the Cold War mentality that had bankrupted the nation while the people starved. So all of these former Soviet rocket scientists and engineers suddenly had little to no funding from the new Russian government. But they kept going to work only because this was their life's passion and they didn't know what else to do. But they might start getting ideas. This is where the US government began to see a massive threat to national security in the making. What would happen if these well-trained and experienced rocket scientists were lured by an enemy nation? Iraq, Iran, Libya, North Korea, all of them eager to get their hands on a nuclear arsenal that could threaten the Western superpowers. Like we said earlier, the difference between an orbital rocket and an intercontinental ballistic missile is negligible, so any amount of Soviet rocket technology falling into the wrong hands would be an existential threat to the established world order. And let's be clear, this fear was not unfounded. Things got so bad at the Russian space program that employees were stealing food rations destined for the Mir station, they were selling off rocket parts from the space program inventory. In 1993, the US government invited Russia to become a full partner in a new space station program, the International Space Station. And as part of the deal, America would send hundreds of millions of dollars flowing into the Russian space program. Everyone would get paid, everyone would have job security, and no one needed to do something crazy like defect to Iran. The first stage of development for the ISS was essentially a second era for Mir. In 1995, another module arrived at the station, Spectre. Not only does that sound like a James Bond villain, Spectre was originally designed by the Soviets to be a top secret military surveillance platform. Under the new international cooperation agreement, Spectre would actually become the living quarters for American astronauts. Spectre also added a second power generator to the growing station with four giant solar arrays. Or at least it did until a Russian Progress spacecraft accidentally crashed into it in 1997. This whole crossover event was a learning experience for both sides. During this time, the Americans were able to learn from the Russians' experience with long-duration spaceflight, NASA was able to get a feel for how the station operated, the challenges and solutions. The American partnership ended up extending the lifespan of Mir from its original five-year intention to 15 years in space. So when we finally arrive at the International Space Station that we all know so well today, we can see that it shares a lot of resemblance with Russia's Mir. The orbital construction of the ISS began in 1998. The first module to go up was a Russian contribution Zarya, responsible for the power and propulsion of the station. This was joined by NASA's Unity module, which forms a link between the Russian side and the American side. Unity is where the entire crew of the station eat their meals together. And the third module deployed was Sviezda. This was originally built in the Soviet Union in 1985 as part of the Mir program. It was a backup core module, just in case there was another problem getting the first Mir into orbit, and Zviezda is based on that familiar old Salyut design, which was based on the Almaz design, which was invented in Russia way back in the early 1960s. Zviezda currently provides life support to the entire space station and is home to the Russian crew. Now, I'm sure at this point everyone knows the rest of the story, what became of the ISS, what became of the relationship between Russia and America, Russia and most of the Western world. It didn't work out so great. But now, as we prepare for the ultimate demise of the ISS in just a few years, the next generation of space stations are rising up. From emerging national powers like China, to the rapidly expanding private spaceflight industry and companies like Blue Origin, the next evolution of the space station has already begun. <laughs>